GR 4101, 5101 lecture number 20. Today I'm going to talk about state machines, continue that up, talk a little bit about more interrupts, and then I'm actually going to touch on some operating system concepts associated with interrupts and, and how everything's going to work together. First, um, I gave a quiz today, and usually I don't show the quiz solutions, but this one I thought would be valuable to, uh, to cover. So the question was, write a state diagram for a dishwasher and again, this is a machine dishwasher, not a person like uh, Mr. Wolf back there who washes the dishes because he's uh, paid to do so. Uh, and that has the following input buttons, fully document all transitions. The implication is you have five buttons, right? I thought it would be inherently obvious that you do a long wash or a wash or a short wash, right? And if you wash, you should rinse as well, right? And dishwashers, I made the assumption, you all knew, I asked that at the beginning, it has a dry cycle unless you push the button that says air dry and then it goes straight to end, right? So every state machine starts with what? An idle state. So we have an idle state. in which everything starts there. And then from there, well, which of these buttons will actually send you to a different state? Pretty much one through four, right? Four different things to do because you have the choice of going to a long wash, a wash, a short wash, or a rinse. In which long wash button, wash button, short wash button, as well as, oops, I forgot to add that all the way at the end. The rinse only button. And then obviously to get out of the wash is some sort of timer. I didn't tell you how long to make them all, so you made your own assumptions, but it's some sort of timer, all right? Hopefully with a long wash, it'll be a long timer. With a short wash, it'll be a short timer. But they'll all go to rinse. Once rinse is complete, either a timer sends it to the dry, ooh, I need to add a timer here too, or the timer with the air dry button sends it back to idle. So this wasn't a hard, Thing. Yes? Uh, is the timer necessary there because the state would itself uh, uh, determine the uh, transitions? So The state would determine which transition? When you say from dry to idle... Uh, that from which one to which one? From dry to idle... Say, uh, from uh, which one? Dry to idle? Yeah, or the extreme left. Or rinse to idle, or both. Well, how long... Rinse will, you will stay in the rinse state until what? Until a timer comes up and says you're done rinsing. All right? You'll agree with that? Yeah. All right? So based on the timer, you'll either transition to the dry state or to the idle state, which will determine which one you go to if the air dry button has been pressed. One time says, in long wash, uh, you know how long you stay there, and then the next transition is to rinse. Mm -hmm. So the timer is implicit in the uh, state machine. I don't understand your question. So uh, do we there, to, uh, you okay? Let's all start. You all agree that button presses, button presses will send you to the wash or the rinse. You all agree with that, right? You all agree that a timer will send you from the wash to the rinse, right? Okay. Now the question is, when do you get out of rinse? Another timer, right? Right, but I think the question was, isn't, it, isn't the state implying that there will be a timer in there? Do we need to explicitly mention that in the transition? Or? Well, the, the, the timer is, the timer, I should say, timer interrupt. 
is what's sending you. Not setting the timer, but it's the timer interrupt that gets you out of the state. It acts as the button, I guess. That is as the button. And we saw examples of that from the previous class. Remember? We had uh, right here already the situation where the timer sent you from the display price to the idle state. And the timer took you from the alarm state to the idle state. So we've already seen that as an example. So uh, four points for states, four for correct transitions, and then two points for neatness, correctness, and the fact that uh, you put both of your team members' name on there. Just wondering, because last quiz, you know, I had people rushing up. I didn't put my name on it. All right. Anybody miss those two points? All right. So that is covered. All right. I want to show you the embedded app of the day. And this is an interesting thing. I had uh, lunch with this gentleman on, uh, on Tuesday at uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite place. Saucer. Saucer. <laughs> Or for those of you out there in uh, um, uh, those of you out there in video land, uh, that would be the Flying Saucer, www.beerknurd.com. So uh, that's no, I won't even go there. Um, what it stands for. So uh, I talked with somebody there. Yeah, you just think about it. Ponder that very carefully. So I talked to somebody there who had a product. And he wanted my opinion on whether or not this is something that academia would buy. So let me describe it. And this is an example of uh, an embedded product because it's got a microcontroller on it. So if you have a battery and you run it to your board or to your application, And your application might have uh, motors, and then your application might also have uh, power and ground to some microcontroller. So I'll ask my uh, my robotics people in here who've done who have done this a lot. What's the biggest problem when you have a uh, a, a battery and you're powering both motors and microcontrollers at the same time? Rain and then uh, the by picking out supply and spark in the control and its control. Okay. So the problem typically is that you have when a motor starts, you have this unbelievable inrush current, which may cause your uh, um, microcontroller. to dip below its own BCC, in other words, the power required to run it accurately. So one thing that they've done here is they've created a, uh, a possibility. So the solution is a possibility where you have power that can supply motors and that is separated to your VCC and ground to your microcontroller. What's another problem you might have with some sort of uh, a vehicle associated with battery power, robotic vehicle? And you want this thing to be running all the time. Say it again. High drain. High drain, which causes it to die quickly. To die quickly or to die, right? So what they have is what's called a hot swappable battery source. So you can plug in two batteries or one. And one gets when one gets really low, then you plug in the other one and you unplug this one. In other words, you're allowing your, your board that's running your, your vehicle to have two different batteries and it can switch between them 
and you can hot swap them. Hot swapping is something that's uh, really good in environments where you need uh, lots and lots and lots of uh, reliability. And usually in microprocessor cards, you can, if something fails in your system, a single card or multiple cards, and you pull out one card and push in another one, and it still is running, you didn't have to reboot. So the whole thing is you don't reboot. So for that, we have this device. And let's see if we can see this good enough. I'm going to zoom in on this. What's the first thing you notice? Big honking. What are these called? Heat sinks. If you look at it really carefully, you see there's some transistors in there. Let's see if you can see them from this end. Yep. Oops. And also something interesting too. Look at this right here. It's a wire that's going right in here. What do you think that might be? Somebody said ground? Not quite. What? Temperature sensor. So it's some sort of temperature sensor that is going onto the board. And it's also very helpful if you look at it. RT, resistor, temperature. Oh, stop autofocusing. Jeez. And so this whole board will allow you to detect the temperature. Now, look at this. It's got a fuse. It's got a fuse. It's got another fuse, connectors, and whoa, what's that right there? So this is a, let's see if we can even see what it is. Nope. The specific chip right there is an, oh man, I'm going to have to zoom out for you to see the name of this. It is an MSP430 variant F2272. And oh, by the way, what do we have right here? A USB port. And what does every USB port need? Some sort of uh, USB communications chip as well. You, you see that on your board as well if you look carefully. So if we look on this, that is an FTDI FT232RL. So if we were to go to our handy dandy notebook, by the way, this is the name of the company, uh, Powerbotics, and he, uh, he loaned this thing to me to uh, be able to uh, use and some of the features of this. Uh, here's the other thing. 30 watts, 12 volts DC, 2.5 amp for the CPU power. The, uh, the um, input in rush current that it could uh, support for each one of the batteries is 25 amps, which is a big motor. So if we were to look at uh, google.com, what did we say? We said uh, MSP 430F2272, Texas Instruments. It'll tell you all about this specific chip in particular. Here it is. It has 32K of flash, 1K of RAM, 16-bit. 32K of flash. Is that a lot of programming space? Do you think you need a lot of programming space for this? Because in this case, the microcontroller is handling some of the um, measurements on the board. It's measuring for temperature. It's actually measuring current. It's measuring voltage. So it can tell you when your battery is about to go low. And via that, it's going to send you via your RS-232. Evaluations aren't supposed to be done today. Oh, they're not? No. Okay. But uh, if you want to, you can sit here at the end of class and I'll let you do them. Okay. I'll come back then. All right. Thank you. Last 10 minutes of class? Sure. The, uh, um, this chip needs to get data to communicate. And to do that, you have uh, the MSP430 
communicating to this via RS-232, which will then send data across the, uh, um, this USB, very similar to just regular RS-232 communications. So that is our embedded app of the day. Oh, by the way, for those of you interested, this is a device called a DC to DC power converter. What it does is it will take the 12 volts, and actually it will output 12 volts. Well, it's up, it's 12 volts and a little bit over, but it will actually give you exactly 12 volts out, and it also has uh, another output that will give you 5 volts. Now, if you were to, uh, let's see if we can see this well. Absolutely. You know what? I just hit the wrong thing. I meant to hit the, the like button, so hold on a second. All right, here we go. Oh, I should not do this when I'm, uh... all right, are we focusing? It's autofocus, turn it off. All right, so if we look at this, and I, I'll let you look at this later. Hey, I turned off autofocus, why did this thing move? And you really can't see that here. Uh, you can see it a little bit better. Yeah, you can't see it at all. I'll let you look at it later, but this entire area here is totally separated from the rest of the board. This has an underlying ground plane that's actually broken right here in this corner. So the ground plane that sits underneath the digital components are totally isolated from that which is underneath the, uh, um, the power components. So you'll often see that in a, uh, in a, in a board that, is, uh, that has a lot of high power associated with it. Any idea how much this board would cost? $273. And 52 cents, right? Thousand dollars. Oh, that thing? I <laughs> like that. That thing? Yep. So, um, I let them know that it's probably unlikely that uh, we would be able to use this for uh, academia, but this would be a really, really good board for, uh, um, for an industrial person who didn't want to design the stuff themselves. All right, so let's continue on with our discussion of interrupts. And along with that, we were uh, talking of in specifically about if you remember recap, we were looking at our snack food machine, which was actually a bit simplified from what it probably really is. And then we had identified all of our interrupts. And we had identified a little bit of detail for our state machine. In other words, based on a switch, depends on what state you are, then you would execute certain functionality. Remember, wow, this was a week ago that we looked at this. The return money state um, re required us to uh, make some settings, display price function. So actually I would like to stop a little bit and say, let's do one more function here, and which one have we not done yet? Well, we haven't done the, uh, we haven't done the validate money and item transition, right? from the money state, or I should say from the, uh, if we're in the validate and money and item state, what do we do? How do we get out of there? So what I would like you to do is between you and somebody sitting next to you, spend a couple of minutes right now working on writing this state function, all right? As an example, here's one example of a function. I'll put this down here in case you uh, forget what it was. 
And I'm going to call somebody up front to actually do that, uh, do this thing. This should be fairly simple because there's only two transitions and it goes only to two different states. You are doing the validate money and item. So just that state? Just that one state. So you are ready in that state. <coughs> Here's a good question. Do you stay in the state very long? Not at all. You do not stay in that state very long at all. So obviously, one thing you have to do is get out of that state somehow, based on logic. As a hint, remember we have a variable here called money count. That would be the last So basically we need to return valid data of one or zero. Well, we got to change the money. We're, we're trying to change the money. So the amount of money you put in is less than the item cost. So if money counts here, let's see what we have. Our state becomes more sustainable. Then we turn to Make one up. Are you all done? All right, we have somebody who's all done. Let's see if they got it. Are the um, the item costs and the money count equal to variables? 
Yeah, we assumed it over the coil. Yeah, you can just assume something. That's what I mean. That's why I punch my coil. All right. Yeah. Well, it has to be a void function, right? Well, why? Uh, how are you passing the stuff in? All right. Here's a good question. If our, if we're assuming that our function, well, does our function have to be, uh, um, what do you call this? Uh, a void. No. Technically, it doesn't have to be. However, since your money vended, total money vended. It's probably a global variable. Just use the global variable. All right? Now, before we go on this, let's, uh, let's make some assumptions. So, our, uh, so the assignment was write the validate. Money and return, or money and item function, right? So here's the assumptions. You have a global variable called what? Money count. What else do you have? Button value. Oops, let me see this. Whatever your button press was, right? So button value or button press or whatever you want to call it. But you also have an array, right? Of You have to know what your item costs are. Yes? We made an assumption that button value was the cost. Oh, so here. Here's your... Uh, you got uh, minus 50% for making an assumption. <laughs> so basically, it's sweet. By the way, this wasn't actual. <laughs> My phone is ringing and I turned it off. So, if we have uh, validate money and item and it's a void, we did have, uh, I, I guess that was right over there, right? We definitely are going to immediately exit from here, right? Mm -hmm. So, if money count is greater than or equal to item cost button value, item cost button value then the state is going to be equal to our next state, which is the, did I already write this? Vend and return. Else, we know that state is equal to uh, money state. And we probably want to do something else, like uh, display uh, price. Oh, well, wouldn't that be on money state? Ooh, that's interesting. Shouldn't the money state display the price? Should the money state display the price? Did we say the money state would display the price of an item you pressed? Or would display how much money you've put in so far? So we'll just call it that. Display price on screen. Right? 
Also, what we want to turn button value back down to zero. R is when you go back to your money state, it'll recall button state. Oh. So interesting enough. So you want to set button value. Equals null. Does that make sense? Is that on yours? Mm -hmm. okay. Now notice one thing that I'm doing in this entire in this entire design. We are doing a, a top-down divide and conquer way of writing our software, right? We've included in there the transitions associated with interrupts. We've noted transitions associated with the state diagram. Notice that everything is centered around the state diagram. It's all identified by state. And that's the way you design when you get into more complex embedded systems. This is a really simple application. When you start getting more complex, like, I don't know, network controllers, home routers, things like that, you'll, uh, you'll have more complex uh, designs than this. All right, let's look at the, uh, the next aspect. And that is associated with priorities. We've looked at our, our possible inputs, right? Certain things are going to be more important than other things associated with interrupts. Remember, interrupts have a priority. Keyboard, lower priority than hard disk drive. So, I want you and your person sitting next to you writing down and prioritizing all of my inputs. These, yes. I noticed some people didn't raise their hand. <laughs> Here's what I did. See if you agree. Now keep in mind that you have to look at all this stuff. And maybe the, uh, the concept is when you insert a coin, it goes in a temporary holding place, right? And it stays there until it's addressed. All right. So from that respect, if somebody's trying to steal it, 
You want somebody to put a coin in there to say, oh, turn off the theft deterrent because somebody really wants to spend money. The chances are no. Maybe they've learned that if you shake the thing and then put a coin in, it turns off the theft deterrent, and then you can turn the machine over, get your food out, and turn it back over, right? So theft deterrent, I put number one, and that's non-maskable. Now, um, return. If you hit the return button, do you want that to take precedence over anything else? Uh, yeah. No. I want coin to be over precedence. All right. It all depends on what you want your customer satisfaction to be, right? If somebody says, I changed my mind, I don't want to buy anything, do you want them to say, oh yeah, the button for vending takes priority over you're hitting the return button at about the same time. Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, because I, I want the money, right? Yeah, well, you know, you might piss off your customer. You might anger your customer, sorry. So um, I put that next. Uh, next is coin. Do you really care what the timer says with respect to, uh, in, in almost all situations, it's, uh, if we look at this, the only one that really will make a difference is uh, when you're in the alarm lockup state and somebody puts a coin in, you want that to take precedence over the timer? Or for that matter here to display price when uh, the timer, again it's a timer interrupt, right? So let's look at this, maybe I, I need to change that. Do I want the timer to have precedence over putting money in? All right. Do I want the uh, 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 return money taking, or the timer taking precedence over return money? So it looks like timer's a little bit lower. Not the fact that you're in this state waiting for the timer to trigger, you are in the timer state. And you're executing whatever's in the timer. Now I'm going to show you where that might come up with problems later, so we'll see. All right? Next, I put, uh, oh, that was all the way at the bottom. So, uh, of course, if you, uh, if you vend or you push a button to say vend, you want that to take precedence over the timer or over anything else. Now, here's the other question. Maskable? Are any of these things maskable? And do you want to allow something in a lower priority? So here's maskable. Think about this. If you are theft, do you ever want to mask this? Maskable means that when you're doing the timer, you don't allow theft to run. So the answer is no. Well, it doesn't matter for this because it's the highest priority. Uh, return, if, if somebody presses the return button and they also activate the theft, do you want the theft thing to be maskable or not, not executed? No. Come on. <clears throat> when you're doing the coin and somebody hits the uh, return, do you want the uh, coin to be higher priority than return? Yes. yes. Are you sure? Yes. I'd rather take in the money and spit out the money. Ah, here's an interesting one. You say yes and no, so we'll leave that one. Medic. The uh, bend button. If you're pressing the vend button and somebody does the theft deterrent, do you want to just keep on executing? No. no. And if the timer is running and somebody does, or the timer interrupt is executing, and uh, the theft thing is uh, going on, no. no, you don't want to do that. Out. So let's look at now. If you're in in uh, executing the theft interrupt service routine. And somebody, and the timer runs, or the button runs, or the button is pressed, or a coin is put in. You want to let the other things execute? No. no. 
All right. If somebody presses the return, do you want the timer to stop whatever's going on? If you press the return button, the only time where it means anything, right? Well, here's an interesting situation. Can you ever, can you ever uh, um, be in the display price, and if somebody presses the return button, does that mean anything? All right. Did we take care of that in our uh, in our design? Look at this. The only time we actually respond is if the state is equal to money state, then we change another state. So in this case, return doesn't do anything. In this case, it, uh, it goes to uh, the return state. If you press, if you're in here and you press return, I guess for all intents and purposes, return will just send it back to, or keep it in this state. If you're in this state and you press return, it'll be ignored. So as it turns out, it doesn't matter. Because it's only really does anything decent when you're in the uh, money state. So the interesting thing is that if you're in the validate and ooh, let me look at this. So let's look at this situation. Oh, this might be an interesting one. So let's say I press uh, a item button. And this is time, right? And right now, this is the time that the, which interrupt service routine is running? the button press ISR, right? Let's say you're in the button press ISR. If state is equal to idle state, then you go to the display state, right? So that's okay. But what if you're in the middle of this, right? and somebody presses the return button. One thing that we said is that if we're in one state, that we'll allow anything with a higher priority to execute, right? So what would happen here? Let's see, if you're in the money state, button press ISR, then you change your state to verification state. But if you're allowing a return button to be pressed, all of a sudden, you will get out of it at this state. So at this point, I'll add something in here saying the state changed from money state, right? to verification state. Oh, that's validate money and, and item. I'll call it validate money and item state. And then suddenly the return button is pressed is, is the state the money state? No, because right now the state is validate money and item state, right? So at that point in time, it will just be ignored and it will be returned. And then you'll exit. And based on what we saw here, 
the button press still will send it to validate money in item state. So notice how there are situations that can uh, that cause it to do some funky stuff. Well, let's look at another situation. Let's say the uh, again this is time. Press item button. And again, this is the button press. ISR. And at this point, if the state is equal to idle state, which it is not, you press the uh, return button. You are at this point of the execution. So now you go up here. Your state is the money state, which you are, then you change your state to return money. So at this point in time, by the way, this is in the return. Money ISR. So you change your running execution to the return money, right? By the way, I should make this go all the way down over there. When you're done, you return. Now keep in mind that during this time right here, this ISR is not running. And based on that ISR up here, the returning return money ISR, this is where your state is returned or changed from money state to which state? Did I lose anybody? Everybody's. It's going to the return state, right? So what happened? What happened here? We had a button press which is supposed to take us to this state, but we also had this one happen which takes us to that state. So what happened? One thing we did is we made none of these maskable, which we also made sure that any, any one of these interrupts could interrupt the other one at a lower level. So what you need to take a look at is, can this take priority over a lower level if we said yes? That means that if we press the button and hit return, it could take over instead of this one right here, still in the uh, interrupt service routine handling it, which means that we will allow two interrupts to happen at one time. What if we said no, as long as you're an interrupt service routine, it can't interrupt anything else? What would happen? Say that again? Higher priority task will not work. Higher priority task will not work. Well, the higher priority could take uh, could take over and change whatever you're doing, if it makes sense. So you can notice now that we have interrupts. We have the ability to have lower priority interrupts run, 
or any interrupt run for that matter. So you have to be really careful of what you allow. So in most cases, you, what we do is uh, when you're running, let's say the coin interrupt, that you don't allow anything of lower priority to take or to interrupt it. So in other words, only that would, of a higher priority may interrupt what you're doing. Which means that at any state in our state machine, even though we don't have it here, at any state, we will change the alarm to the alarm back lockup. In other words, it doesn't matter where we are, it'll always happen. Now here's the other problem. If we were here in the money state, the alarm lockup, right? Notice we go back to the idle state. But there was money inserted. How do you handle that? Hmm. Now you have to start thinking of everything going on. If we allow the theft possibility to move you out of any state, you have to assume that anything that would take you out of this state back to the idle state is going to be done. So you have to make sure that you return money. So in that case, you need to, in the alarm lockup state, you need to uh, make sure you return the money. So is this pretty complex? The answer is yes. That's why embedded systems engineers make so much money. Just heard from one of my uh, students today, Suraj Swami, if you happen to know him. He's contemplating uh, three job offers. It took him a couple of months to find it, but they all came in at the same time. He's already turned down one, and he's looking at a startup. So that's the joy of embedded systems. Lots of jobs everywhere. Woo! That's all I have for today. On my next class, what I'm going to do is go over specifics associated with setting up timers. And that will be our last class on interrupts. Thank you very much. By the way, 